Good morning and thank you for joining us here at KCC Online. As many of you know, we are in the midst of a lockdown period here in the state of Washington and the entire month of April, we will not be holding in-person services. If that's going to change in the future, we will let you know. But just because we're not meeting together in person, we still have options to meet with one another online. On our KCC Facebook page, we have a schedule of all the events that are still going on over the internet of course but anything from youth group to ladies bible study young adult bible study they are still available and you can find out who you need to get in touch with to be a part of those groups you also find videos uploaded daily from our daily bible study reading plan that we're doing together as a church and some people have already posted some worship services that they've been doing at home and other messages of encouragement if you need any more info on those things you can check out the Kent Christian Center Facebook page if you happen to already be a part of the case KCC family and consider Kent Christian Center to be your church home and you are wondering how you might be able to still give of your tithe and offering, you can do so online. All you have to do is either follow the links down in the description below or head to kentchristiancenter.org. Up in the top right hand corner you'll see a link that says giving. Once you click the link follow the directions and you can give both your tithes and offerings online. If you'd like to do so in person, of course you can do that here anytime at the church. Or you can also do so by mail. We also encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date of everything that's going on here at KCC. Thank you once again for joining us here and of course we would love to meet you in person real soon. Good Resurrection Sunday morning. All of you KCC uh, followers and also those of you who may be following us today during this uh, COVID-19 virus pandemic where we're doing services online. Welcome, welcome to this uh, Easter Sunday morning. What an awesome time to be alive. What an awesome time to be able to come together with you today and to share the endless, timeless message that Jesus is alive. He's not dead, he's alive. And so uh, as we come to this service today, I want just to, to emphasize that again and again. It's all about him as it was last week. He's alive. But also I want to just say to you right up front so that you can prepare that at the end of the message today, we will be partaking of communion. So I want to give you that, that heads up so that if you would like to, you could run really quickly now, maybe get some juice together, uh, get some bread together. If you're from... Uh, some backgrounds of ethnic backgrounds, you might have some tortillas instead of bread, but uh, whatever you might use, uh, the Lord understands. And so we want to partake of communion together at the close of this service today. Well, let's begin just with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this awesome day that you've made for us. And Lord, we thank you that in this uh, modern age that we live in, that we can still gather together in our homes uh, across the miles and we can share together and we can listen together to a message. We've already listened to worship before this message began and Lord, there's just so many, so many good ways that we can uh, receive the gospel and, and hear about you, Lord, and, and that we can talk about you on this Easter season and, and that we can share the message that Jesus Christ is alive. We don't serve a dead God, but we serve the living God. We serve the God who's the God of all hope. And, and so, Father, today I pray that you would just, uh, in this time that we have together, that you would speak through me. God, you'd give me your words to speak beyond my capabilities and abilities. God, that would touch the hearts and the lives of the people. I pray that everyone who listens in today, Lord, in some way or another, Father, will receive something from your word that will strengthen their hearts, strengthen their lives, Lord, and cause them to be hungry for more and more of you. We just give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I, I want to begin today by just reading the scripture. Uh, I've, I've found myself more and more, the longer I have preached, reading more and more scripture. I, some time ago, probably four or five years ago, it really kind of began. I felt like God spoke to my heart. Well, it's good, and God gives us things to say. He gives us words to speak. But the, the word that holds the most water is simply the scripture, the word of God. And so I always want to make sure that I, that I include the scripture in any message that I ever preach. And we're going to be reading the, the story of the uh, resurrection today from Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, just the first 10 verses. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven 
and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat on it. I find that kind of amusing that he used it for a chair. <laughs> his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Here's the guards, so afraid of this angel, one angel of God, that they shook and they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. He would say that several times. Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said he would. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, and yet it says they were filled with joy. That's an amazing combination. Afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshiped him. I want you to notice he didn't tell them not to do that. That means he was the son of God. God, if it was angels, they'd always forbid people to worship them. But if it was God and Jesus was God, he allowed them to worship him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. There it is coming from Jesus. Now, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee. There they will see me. I want to just begin today by, by making sure that I'm understood that the cross is of utmost importance. We're keying in because this is Resurrection Day and we're keying in more on the uh, attributes of the re resurrection and what that means to us. But without the cross, there would be no need of a resurrection. But if Jesus did not rise from the dead, if he really didn't rise from the dead, then we might as well, we might as well just go back and, and do something else. We might as well search elsewhere. We might as well look for uh, another religious system that can uh, fulfill the promises that they say that they're God. But thanks be unto God, he did rise from the dead, and that is what I want to share with you today. He rose from the dead, and we serve the only, we serve the only risen Savior. I want you to keep that in your thought process, because I don't believe that there's any other religion or religious system that even claims to have a Savior or the leader of their, of their religious system who has risen from the dead. But I also want to make clear that Jesus isn't just the leader of a religious system. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the mighty God. He is all that he said he was. Amen. And so uh, we, we lift our hearts. We lift our voices to him. We serve the only risen Savior. He's alive. And I believe the anointing and the resurrection power of God is present here in this place today. That same, that same uh, Holy Spirit that, that brought him up from the dead is available to you and I today in this day and age that we live in to strengthen us, to encourage us. Amen in everyday life as we go along. It's here to save every sinner, everyone who does not know Jesus as Lord. The Holy Spirit is here to, first of all, convict man of their sin and their need of a Savior. You see, that's why Jesus came. He came to be a Savior because we needed, we had to have a Savior. No man can save himself. There's no man-made God that can save us. There's only one that can save us. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. A teacher asked her pupils one time, who is the greatest living man? Well, they said different things. Uh, somebody said, I, well, I, it's the Pope. Someone else said, uh, you know, no, I believe it's my dad. That's a good one, right? Dad's a great man, one of the greatest living men. And it was a young kids. And so finally one kid popped up and said, Tom Brady. And now some of you are going to like that. Some of you are going to hate that. <laughs> but that's who this kid thought was, uh, was somebody that was pretty special. But then one little boy finally wrote in and talk, spoke up. He said, Jesus, Jesus is the most famous man. And uh, noting this answer, the teacher replied, I said, I, young man, he said, I said a living man. And the young man said, but he is living. He is living. You see, there's many today that believe lots of things, as I shared last week during Palm Sunday, they believe lots of things about Jesus. They believe that he was a good man. He was a prophet. They believe that he, uh, he did heal the sick. He did perhaps raise the dead. Some will even give credence to that, even though he really did. 
and yet, yet they still refuse to believe that He is Jesus, the Son of God, the only Savior of mankind, the only hope of mankind. There is no other hope other than Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Well, I want to talk to you today about the cross and how the cross or a manger should not be the only church symbols, but there should be another symbol that we very seldom, I don't know if we ever have in our churches, and it should be an open grave, a tomb with a stone rolled back from it. Years ago in my last church, we were doing an Easter production, and on Friday night when we were doing the production, when it came time for the person to come and roll the stone back and Jesus to come out, nobody came and rolled the stone back. And Jesus never came out. The production ended and, and I, I was very, you can imagine a pastor sitting back there, what in the world's going on? And uh, anyway, somebody had missed a cue and so Jesus refused to come out for some reason or another. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you something. Nobody missed a cue when Jesus was in that tomb, when, he's, when he'd laid down his life for us on the cross and when they buried him in that grave. And when it was time for him to come forth, that angel came and he rolled that stone away, amen. And Jesus came forth just like he had been prophesied that he would do many hundreds of years before. Jesus is riven, risen. He's triumphant. The open tomb is a, is a sign of victory, that the victory has been won, that the tomb, that, that death, that the grave could not hold him. And thus we believe that the grave cannot hold us who know him and serve him and live for him and have given our lives to him. And it's, a, it's to say that, that the tomb represents victory over COVID-19. You know, God, God isn't taken aback by all the problems that we're having right now in America and in this world. He knows all about these things. He's been around a long time. And nothing, nothing, about, he, he can do anything at any time. And he can give us the victory over anything at any time. It's victory over hell. It's victory over sin. It's victory and it's life. Jesus Christ brings life, not death. He is the light of the world and he brings life. Christians are not to be mourners. We don't, we don't need to see at any time, in any stage in our life, and especially during this time, that we would be mourners or professional mourners who put on dark clothes and walk around with their heads down saying, Jesus is dead. He isn't dead. He's very much alive. Jesus is alive. And that's our symbol that we have a risen Savior. He is no longer in the tomb, but he's alive forevermore. He's at the right hand of the Father is actually what the Bible says he is doing all this time. And he's there doing something specifically, he's there making intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. Praise God. If there's any truth in the world that Satan hates, it's this truth that Jesus is alive. I believe that Satan mustered all the forces of hell that he could muster to try to keep Jesus in the tomb. I believe he, he's so dumb that he thought he had won the victory, that he'd finally killed God, <laughs> and that, that he was going to be victor, but, but he couldn't hold. He couldn't hold. No, not all the demons in hell could hold Jesus in that tomb. He arose with a, vi a victor from the dark domain, the songwriter said, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. If you don't believe that Satan hates this truth and fights it, then just think of all the great books or the movies that we have seen uh, about Jesus, that talk about Jesus. Many of them, they're very elaborate about, about the crucifixion and, and, uh, and, and down to details of the goriest details of the crucifixion. And, and it's okay, we need to understand that. Jesus died a horrible death for our part so that we could have life, so that we could live. And, and so they're very detailed and very vivid and very imaginative. But how much space does the resurrection get? It seems like we don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of movies and a lot of space on the resurrection. There's not much. Mel Gibson and others need to go further and give us much more attention to the resurrection. That's what Easter is really all about. It's about the resurrection because you see, if Jesus is still in the tomb, we're in, we're in dire straits. We're in trouble today. You see, Satan doesn't care much if you believe in Christ and his death, and if you think that he's still dead. He was a good, all these good people, that he was all these good things. Even if he's a prophet, Satan doesn't care as long as you believe that Jesus is dead and cannot help you, cannot do anything for you. You see, he sure doesn't want you to believe in the resurrection. He doesn't want you to believe that, it's, that it really, really happened and that it really is true to this day. That is why in our contact, in our contract for salvation in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 9, here's what it says. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What do you have to confess and what do you have to believe in your heart before you confess it? A lot of people make all kinds of confessions. A lot of people might even just kind of off the cuff, yeah, I confess Jesus. But he says, you got to believe it in your heart. 
It's got to come from the heart. The mouth only speaks what's coming from the heart. And if you truly believe in your heart and you believe that Christ Jesus died for your sins and that he rose again on that third day, then he says, if you'll confess that, you will be saved. The truth of the resurrection is paramount to the Christian church. Paul even said so. Scripture reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 through 19. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you, you should just go read the whole chapter because it's a great book on, on the resurrection. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Think about that. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. And, and it's right now to this very day, to what I'm standing up here today. If he hasn't risen from the dead, my preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, he says, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That's the tragedy. That's the tragedy. But I can tell you today, it's not a tragedy because Christ was raised from the dead, amen? And so your sins are forgiven. Then he says, those who also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. All those who've died before us, all those who've believed over the 2,000 some years since Christ rose from the dead. He said, they're all lost too. If, for only, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're of all people most pitied. Wow, most pitied. Paul is, Paul is writing here, he's writing to the Corinthian church, and they didn't think that there was going to be a resurrection, except, you know, especially the Sadducee branch. They, that's why we say they were Sadducee, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. He's saying, listen, church, listen, you Corinthians, and today he would be saying it to us, to whatever church you may belong to, if it's a Christian church, and you supposedly are celebrating this resurrection Sunday, he'd say, listen, get smart. Get smart, wake up. Jesus is already raised. He's already raised from the dead. You see, and so that's, that's the first proof of the resurrection. That's why you can have all this excitement in your heart and know that, that listen, as bad as, as the pandemic gets, as bad as life gets for you personally, as bad as life gets in this world, it, listen, this isn't our final home. We're not here. We, we who really know the Lord, and if you know the Lord and you, and you surrender to His Lordship, it's all about going to be with Him in heaven someday. He said, he said, I've gone away and I'm preparing a mansion for you that where I am, there you may be also. I have a home here just about uh, a mile and a half away from where I'm standing right now. And I go there day after day. And I'm, in fact, I'm there all day for recent weeks now. I'm home more than I've ever been in my life, I believe. And, and, and yet, that's not my final resting place. Uh, I, I have some good days. I have some bad days. I have some difficult days. I have some days with great victories. But I tell you what, my final resting place is heaven. I'm looking for that home whose builder maker is God himself. And Jesus is the one, if you believe in Jesus and you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, he's the one and the only one that you trust in him that you can know for sure, for sure that you're going to make it to that home in heaven. Praise God. Well, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, all of our preaches are in vain and we're still in our sins. That's what he said in the, some of those verses there. Think about, I want, I want you to just think a moment about uh, some of you, maybe younger people will not realize some of these names, but uh, think about some of the uh, great preachers who have lived down through the years. Think about men such as uh, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards uh, preached that, that message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I have a copy of it actually, actually of that. And, and I read it sometimes I think, wow. Uh, they say that when Jonathan Edwards preached that with such conviction of the Holy Spirit upon him, that, that men would, would grab a hold of the pews and hang on to the pews to keep from falling out on the floor. But they was under such a conviction of the power of the Holy Spirit. And men would fall out on the floor and men would just begin to weep and cry out and, and repent. And, and I, I tell you, we need more preachers like that. We need more preaching that causes people to recognize their need for repentance. And we need a revival of repentance in the United States of America. Paul said, he said, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then that kind of preaching is in vain. There's no need for another Jonathan Edwards. There's no need for the one we had. But I'm telling you something, his preaching wasn't in vain because, because Jesus said, whenever I, when I arise and I go back to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. 
And the Holy Spirit's going to help you. The Holy Spirit's going to be your counselor. The Holy Spirit's going to empower you to preach and to teach. And, uh, and so it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that works in a man's life. It was the power of the Holy Spirit working in Jonathan Edwards as he spoke those words that caused people, sinners in the hands of, a, of an angry God, to fall on their face and get right with God. And we need that kind of preaching. We need that kind of teaching today that people would fall on their, on their face and get right with God. Paul said that. Now we have today, we've had preachers like Billy Graham and Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody and John Wesley in, in, in about the last century that's gone by. But we need more of those to rise up now. I'm believing that God is even now putting a great hunger in the, in the lives of so many millennials. The millennials have gotten such a, a bad rap as a, as a kind of a, like a lost hope. But I believe, I believe God is not done with millennials. I believe God is going to t touch their lives. I believe God is going to move in the hearts and the lives of, of all all the, all the different age groups, but, but above, above all the millennials. And I believe we're going to see some great preachers. Who knows who the next Jonathan Edwards is? Who knows who the next young man who will be, who's even now being prepared by God to rise up and to preach the message of hope in Christ Jesus. Uh, the list could go on and on. But if Jesus is not raised, then every one of these men who have preached that message throughout time have wasted their time. If Jesus not raised, is not raised, then I would be wasting my time today. But He is raised. Jesus is not raised from the dead. We are never we are never going to be raised either. But praise God, we have that hope. We know that He did rise, and so will we. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 23 there, we read on, it said, but Christ, but Christ, listen, Paul gets to the good part here. He said, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as Adam, listen to this, for as in Adam all die. I've heard people say, that's not fair. One man sinned and so now we all sin. We all are doomed to sin. How's that fair? Well, you can say that. I'll give you that. But let me tell you what's not fair neither. That one man died so that we could all be reconciled to God. It's even more powerful because we didn't have the capability. No man, no man has, no man who has ever lived other than Jesus Christ has had the capability of being the sinless, perfect sacrifice that it would take, that it would take to save us from our sins. We, we, we owed a debt we couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't know. I thank, I thank God for Jesus Christ, his son, that he came and he did what was necessary to save us from our sins. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits. That's what we're talking about today. 2,000 years ago, Christ the firstfruits. He's the firstfruits. And then when he comes, those who belong to him. I ask you that question today. Do you belong to him? Do you know him? Again, I'll ask that several times today because it's so crucial at this Easter season that you don't just even get a, a nice little good feel good about Easter, but that you really know and that you really belong to Jesus Christ. There's a story about the one who rose from the dead. The story goes that, and it could have been any religious group or any person, or it could have been an atheist, but this particular guy was a, was a Muslim man. He, he, he just got saved one day. He, he got, God spoke to his heart, the Holy Spirit administered his heart. And so and it, was, it was shocking to his family because they had no, they, they didn't realize that this was happening. He didn't realize it was happening, but, but it came quickly. And so he gave his heart to the Lord. And so they're asking him, how, how could you do that? How could you make that decision to follow Jesus Christ? And he said, well, it was pretty easy, actually. He said, I was thinking about if you're traveling down the road and you come to a fork in the road and you don't know which way to go, who would you trust, a dead man or a living man? And Jesus Christ is the living man. He's the living God. He's the one who knows all things, says all things, does all things. And so I believe in the one, he said, I believe in the one who rose from the dead. I believe in the living Jesus, the living man. Listen to this preacher today. Do you believe that Christ rose from the dead? Have, have you today, have you repented of your sins and placed your hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus and Him alone? You see, you say, Pastor, you've said that several times already. I want to make sure that we get that very clear today. Have you trusted Him? To, have you put your life in Him? He, he has the resurrection power. You say, I, I don't think I can live the life. He will give you the power to live the life. You see, the, the old song, one of the old songs says, not only does He... he, he uh, 
he cancels the debt of, of sin that's in the past, but he, he can help us to live with power so that we can live for him. We can live powerfully for him. We don't have to live under the old life anymore. All things become new when we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so, so we, we are now in him. He's helping us. He strengthens us. Amen. And he gives us what we need. And so we know that. Almighty God has declared already that it is appointed in a man wants to die. Do you know where you'll go? That's a good question that, that maybe we should stop and ponder again because we, we have so many of our friends and loved ones and, and people that, that we don't know, but they're, they're famous people that we do know or hear about. And, and so many that, that are passing away, that are dying because of this virus. And, and yet, yet as life goes by all the time, people are dying. I, I don't remember exactly. It seemed like somebody said that there had to be 300 and something, 50,000 people a year die in America or whatever to keep the population right. I don't know. But listen, the fact is there's a lot of people that die every year. And, and the fact is, we need to stop and think sometimes, where do I think I'm going to go when I die? When I breathe my last breath in this life, what happens after that? Will I go to heaven? Will I go to hell? I can tell you, you have two choices. If you've pl placed your trust in the risen Christ, when you die, your body will go to the ground. That's what the scripture says, dust to dust. Ashes to ashes, your body will return to that. Your body will go into the ground. But your soul, your spirit, the part of you that is your personality, that is the real you. Immediately the scripture says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So that next, that next less than a tick of a second, I don't believe there's probably any time in between. You, you, you breathe your last breath here, you, your life is done, and immediately you're the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your body will go into the ground, but your spirit, your soul goes into a place of torment. Jesus said so in the book of Luke. You can look it up, chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. We're not going to turn there or look at that today. But Jesus said, he said that there was a great man, there was a man who died who didn't have God in his life, and he said that he wound up in torments. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. He wound up in torments. And, uh, and we, know, we know that Jesus preached and, uh, and he talked more about hell than almost any other subject in his ministry. Why would he talk so much about that subject? Because he was coming to save people from having to go there because he offered them eternal life. They had a choice. You have a choice now. You can choose Jesus and you can choose heaven. You can choose to go and be with him throughout eternity. Well, friends... For those of you watching uh, who are not a part of KCC, those of you who are a part of the KCC body of believers, it's been a, about a full month now and it just seems like a, an eternity since we've got to get together. But I just want to say to you today, and, and as I begin to close, that, that Jesus has done all that needs to be done and all that can be done to save your eternal soul from torment. He, he made the decision. He chose he chose, he knew the scripture says before the foundations of the world were ever laid. He chose to lay down his life and to give his life that you might have life. He chose to die. He made the decision to die for you so that you could make the decision to live for him. And he wants you to live for him. He wants you to give glory and honor to him. He, he, he wants to bless you. He wants to help you. He wants to guide you. He wants to direct you. Some things that he would direct our lives in aren't always easy. He never promised us that life would be easy. But he simply, he simply said, I will be there for you. But only you can make that decision. Nobody, nobody can decide for you. No one else can make the decision for you. You have to decide if you're going to follow Jesus or not. He wants you to release the reins of your life, get off the throne and give him charge of your life and follow him. It's that simple, really. And that seems kind of simple, but it's very difficult sometimes to give up the throne of our lives. We give up parts of it. We give up a little bit of our life, but we often hang on to different parts and pieces. But God says, give it all to me. And in giving it all to him, he gives himself all to us. Uh, we come and we know that God is real in our hearts and lives. In closing and leading into our time, I wanted to make some time for communion today. I just want to say again, Jesus Christ is alive. He is the way. He is the truth. I want us to understand that the risen Savior is the truth. He didn't say, I am one of many truths, or I am some truth, or partial truth. He is all truth. <laughs> he is the only one that we can get all truth from. And he's the life that God is speaking to some of you today. The, the, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, is, is tugging at your heart's door today. Is speaking to your heart this Easter Sunday morning. And he's calling to you to surrender your life to him. You're the only one that can make that decision. Preachers could plead with you. 
the Holy Spirit can draw you. The Holy Spirit can convict you. The Holy Spirit can cause you to know that you have need of a Savior. But only you can make the decision to accept Jesus Christ and ask Him to come into your heart and your life. Uh, and so it's time to surrender to your life to the risen Savior. Today, on this Easter Sunday, this is the day of salvation. This is the day to give your heart and your life to Jesus. We read a little bit of this scripture earlier, but in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then the scripture goes on to say, for with a heart one believes unto righteousness. Not your own righteousness, you're believing unto the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You take on His righteousness, because our own righteousness can never save us. One believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Wow, I didn't set the way that it would happen. It's God who said that this is what we need to do to be saved. We need to make our confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to understand and really believe in our heart. That heart belief says no one else can do this but Jesus. He is who he said he was. He was God come in the flesh. He lived, he died, he rose again. He's the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. And one day we believe that we will rise also if we know him and we die in him. And so you must make that decision. And also in Matthew 10, 32 through 33, it says this, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, speaking of Jesus, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. That's a pretty critical statement right there. Jesus said, if you refuse to, to acknowledge me before man and confess me before man, then I will not confess you before the Father. And if you're not being confessed before the Father by Jesus Christ, you're in real trouble. You need to confess Jesus Christ. You need to allow him to be the Lord of your life. And he wants to be today. Today, do you believe? Have you repented? Have you received your Lord and Savior? It's not just any time. This is the time. This is the opportunity that God gives you today. And so I want us to pause here and I want us to pray. And, and I, I want to just, I want to just ask you, I want to ask you individually. I'm going to pray a prayer. You can pray along with me or you can pray your own prayer. But sooner or later you need to pray your own prayer. But it's simply this. Confess Jesus as Lord. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. He wants to. He's willing to. He's desires to. Ask him to forgive you and come into your heart. And make a decision. Make a decision today that you're going to follow Christ. You'll make some mistakes. You'll have some downfall. But listen, that you're going to set your course to be a Christ follower. And to love him with all of your heart and all of your life and all of your mind and all of your strength. So let's pray together today. Father, Father, I thank you on this Easter Sunday morning. Lord, when we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I thank you, Father God, that today you're calling, you're tugging at the, at the heart of individuals. I pray, God, that you would just even now just bring great conviction of sin to hearts and lives. But Lord, you don't bring conviction to leave us there. But Lord, you bring us to conviction so that you can save us and so that we can be relieved of that burden of sin. Only you can relieve us of the burden of sin, Lord. Only you can forgive us of sin. Only you can cast it as far as the east is from the west. And only you, Lord, can forget it and never to remember and hold it against us ever again. We thank you, Father. Lord, I pray right now, I pray right now that there will be individuals, individuals listening to me right this very moment, who will surrender their hearts and their lives to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They believe you rose from the dead. You are who you said you were. And you're still, you're still saving souls today. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As we look toward a communion time this morning, uh, normally uh, I think this is actually the first time in all those 40 times, some times that I've done an Easter, Easter service that I've actually done communion. But some people were requesting it and we didn't have a, a good Friday communion service. And so I wanted to make this available uh, for us today. So if you've already got your emblems ready or if you haven't, you've got a few seconds here before we'll start uh, actually uh, using them so you can, you can get ready and, and join us in the communion time. Uh, at Kent Christian Center, we, we practice open communion. We do emphasize that uh, 
The only requirement is that you need to be a child of God. You need to have done what I've just been asking you to do, to make that confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and then you'd be ready to partake of the, of the communion emblems together. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it talks about how we are to examine ourselves before we partake of communion. And so we see he, he's not talking to people that don't know him at all. He's talking actually to Christians there. And he says it's a good thing before you partake because this is a, this is a, a crucial thing that we're doing here. It's not, not something that we take lightly. He said, take, take a moment to examine yourself and make sure there's, there's not anything that needs to be cleared up with God. And, and I would say too, there's not anything that needs to be cleared up with your neighbor. Or your, or your brother or sister in Christ. And if, there's, if there are things that are harboring in your life, if there's sin, if there's hardship, there's difficulties, uh, forgiving that you're having, he says you need, you need to pray about that. You need to bring that before the Lord. The Lord will help you to do what you need to do. Anything God asks us to do, he helps us to do it. And so uh, we, we want to just take just a moment here to, to bow our heads and to ask for uh, God to help us to, to see if there's anything in our lives that needs to be cleared up. Father, we just thank you now. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to examine ourselves now. Lord, you didn't say examine someone else, but you said examine ourselves. Turn the searchlight of your Holy Spirit upon me, Lord. Turn it upon each of us that are listening right now. And God, if there's things in our lives that are not pleasing to you, Lord, we don't want them there. We don't want them there, Lord. Hallelujah. Show us now, Lord. God, we will be quick, quick to ask forgiveness. Quick, Lord, to say, Lord, I'm going to lay that down. I'm going to lay that aside. Lord, with your help, I'm going to lay it aside and not ever pick it back up again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We look to the scripture in, Ma in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. This was the first time of partaking of the elements with Jesus and the disciples there in the upper room. And it says there that he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And so as we hold this Whatever you might have today, I have a little cracker here in my hand uh, representing the body of Jesus. I, 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 thought about, I thought about it last evening. This was the very first time that this took place with Jesus and the apostles and the, the disciples. But before they probably, I, we don't know, they could have, but before they would ever do it again, because he said, this do in remembrance of me as often as you do it even. But before they were ever going to do it again, they were going to see a lot of things happen. They're going to have some more remembrances of Jesus. They're going to have some remem remembrances of Judas hanging himself, betraying Christ. They're going to have some remembrance of not even being able to, to pray for one hour with him in the garden in his greatest hour of trial. They're going to have some remembrance of the cruel crucifixion and, and denying him, Peter especially, with, before the cock crowed thrice, he denied him. And, and they have all these things. And, and seeing him on the cross there, and, uh, and then brought down. But thank God, they're also going to have a new remembrance. They're going to have the resurrected Lord. <laughs> they literally saw him with their own eyes. And, and so uh, they had a remembrance that they would remember the rest of their life. And, and uh, the scripture says that even though we haven't seen him, blessed are we who have not seen him, yet we have believed. That would be you and me today, that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he did rise from the dead. And so I, I thought about all of those memories. Uh, and I think... Let's remember today what Jesus has done for us. Let's remember today what he has done for the world. Let's remember today that he, he, he is the only savior of mankind. And so, Lord, we, we take and we hold this bread in our hand. And we just say, thank you, Jesus, for your body that was, was uh, ripped, uh, flesh ripped off with a cat of nine tails and your beard plucked out and and a, a, a crown of thorns placed on your head and then beat down with reeds and into the scalp and blood running down your face and around your head. Lord, you paid a, a horrible price and your body was so broken, but your body was necessary to go on the cross and to shed your blood 
that we might have life. Thank you for the bread. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this bread representing your body. We partake of it now in Jesus' name. Also in Luke 22, verse 20, the next verse, it says, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. For you. Jesus died for you, and you, and you. Jesus gave his life. They didn't take his life. You see, Pilate said, don't you know that I have power? Jesus said, you only have power, well, you only have the power that God gives you. And, and it's that way today. You know, there's, there's all kinds of people that think they're in charge, but God is ultimately in charge. But he said, I'm doing this. I'm pouring out my blood. I'm pouring out the blood of the covenant for your sake. Because if he didn't do it, there was no one else to do it. There was not a plan two or plan B or plan C or D. He was the plan and the only plan and the only hope of mankind. And so he did it for us. He poured out his blood and he literally signed, signed the seal of the new covenant with his own blood. Can we say as we lift the cup up to him today, Lord Jesus, this cup represents a, a tremendous, tremendous sacrifice Lord, I, I believe the greatest sacrifice of all time. Because you who were God in the beginning, you was with God and all things were made by you. And yet you were willing to come to this earth, become flesh and blood, become one of us, become a human. So that you could endure all things that we endure. So that you can see and, and sense and feel and know the things that we face. And, and Lord, that it would help you to have a compassion over us. And Lord, I, I praise you that you came and you lived and you died and you didn't sin in the process. You stayed a perfect, sinless, sacrificing Lamb of God. And so today, Lord, you've signed that covenant with your blood. And so we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the covenant, the blood of salvation. And so we thank you and we give you praise. And we partake together now of the cup in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you now. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you for his body that was torn. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you endured the cross, the pain, the shame, the suffering, Lord. You endured the cross because you looked ahead to what was before you. And Lord, part of that was the joy of the salvation of millions of people who would come to know Christ and would be saved from that awful torment of hell. And we thank you, Father, today that you finished the course. Now help us, Lord. Help us as we commit ourselves to you to finish our course, Lord. We don't know maybe as much as you knew what our course will be, but Lord, we know that you will guide us and direct us, Lord. And we know that nothing, nothing can happen, nothing can take our lives or take us out until you're finished with, our, with us here on this earth, Lord. And so, God, we commit ourselves to you again and afresh and anew on this Easter Sunday morning, Lord. We commit our lives. We commit everything that we are, every hope to be, Lord, to you. And we say, Lord... We thank you for the things that we have here, but Lord, ultimately, we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God himself. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, remember, he's alive. He's alive forevermore. Amen. And the stone's been rolled away. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the devil has been defeated. Death, hell, and the grave is defeated. Jesus Christ is alive. And so go ahead and shout it. Amen. Jesus is alive. Amen.